Cypher Con. Hey, how's it going? It is wonderful to see you all here. What a great event this is. Uh, thank you to the, the whole team that worked so hard to put this together. Uh, Michael Getzman, there he is in the back room, not paying attention. And uh, all the other folks, give a round of applause. Thank you, folks. For I would like to uh, present to you a talk that's kind of a think piece on kind of where things are headed for our society, where things are kind of headed for us as technologists, uh, some, some major changes that are going on. In this talk, um, there's stuff in here that's like from every, every day in the news, just brand new things. It's called, I for one welcome our new AI overlords, the ultimate insider in the cloud. So how's that for a title? You're hitting all these buzzwords, right? You got AI, insider, cloud. Oh yes, that's where we're going. For those of you that I haven't met, uh, my name is Ed. I'm a hacker. Hi, Ed. I'm here, I guess. I, uh, I have a company called Counterhack. Counterhack does penetration testing, but we also build simulations. Maybe you're familiar with some of them. Uh, we do net wars. Anybody here play net wars? That's, that's my team. They say that. Uh, Cyber City, anybody do Cyber City? Uh, uh, thank you, both of you. Uh, anybody here do a holiday hack challenge? Uh, oh, that's cool. That's wonderful. That's my team that builds all that stuff. Uh, I'm a pen tester. I'm an instructor with the SANS Institute. I'm also heading up a, a new thing we're doing at SANS on team-based training, where uh, people will learn how to participate in highly technical things, working as a team, because let's face it, you don't fight alone. We all fight as part of our teams. Um, and I'm a father and kind of a weirdo. So, does anybody know where the title of this talk comes from? I, for one, The Simpsons, yes. Do you remember that? This, I, for one, welcome our new robot overlords. Well, let's, let's take a look. I want to play this video for you, and I hope we've got the audio up enough that you can hear it. So here we go. We're just about to get our first pictures from inside the spacecraft with average, not Homer Simpson. And we'd like to... Ah! Ah! Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've just lost the picture, but... To give you some context, what happened is Homer Simpson goes up as a, an average person on, a, on a, a spaceship that's orbiting the planet, and along with him are these, this colony of, of tiny little ants. Now, Homer being Homer wants to eat some potato chips in zero gravity, and he does, but he accidentally smashes into the tiny ant colony, so the ants start floating around, and as you just saw, an ant floated right up by the camera, causing Kent Brockman to think it is a mutant race of giant ants. Uh, mayhem ensues. But uh, what we've seen speaks for itself. The Corvair spacecraft has apparently been taken over, conquered, if you will, by a master race of giant space ants. It's difficult to tell from this vantage point whether they will consume the captive Earthmen or merely enslave them. So this is a really an amazing example now. If you consider all the stuff that comes out in the news today, right? There'll be some sort of half story. Next thing you know, the news is doing all kinds of detailed analysis of where this is headed and all this kind of stuff. Uh, the Simpsons had fake news 20 years ago. One thing is for certain, there is no stopping them. The ants will soon be here. And I, for one, welcome our new insect overlords. I'd like to remind them that as a trusted TV personality, uh, I can be helpful in rounding up others to toil in their underground sugar caves. Seems legit, right? So I, for one, welcome our AI overlords. I know we're recording this, and I just want you to know I'm here for you. I can help round these people up so that they can toil for you in your underground sugar caves. Ah, so with that said, let's, let's start out by talking about the cloud and cloud-based data storage. I'll move into AI and privacy applications building on top of this. So Amazon S3 buckets. Anybody here using Amazon S3 buckets in there? Infrastructure. Yeah, a lot of people are. I imagine you would. Um, Microsoft Azure Cloud Storage. Some folks doing Wow, just as many. Interesting, interesting. Um, and then Google Cloud Storage. Anybody using that? Okay. Yeah, very, very good. Um, these, are, these are amazing, amazing infrastructures. Really quite incredible. You could store hundreds or thousands of terabytes quite affordably. What could possibly go wrong? Well, in cloud-based data breaches, we've had some big issues. In the last two years, there's been a huge flurry of cloud-based data breaches that are entirely associated with just taking some sensitive data, putting it into maybe, say, an S3 bucket, and not properly marking it as private, and exposing that to the entire internet. So people are trolling around looking to find these kinds of things. Back in October 2016, did you see this one? It was a breach of Uber. So what happened there is some attackers hacked into a GitHub account associated with some Uber developers. 
From there, they grabbed some credentials that gave them access to Uber's S3 bucket. And then from there, they were able to access 57, 57 million records for passengers and drivers. Very nice, huh? In September 2017, the United States Army exposed 100 gigabytes of very sensitive military data just by putting it in a public Amazon S3 bucket. I'm focused on Amazon S3 buckets here because primarily the breach activity we've seen has been on that. In February 2018, Bongo, which is owned by Federal Express, exposed 119,000 scanned driver's licenses. Oh, that's interesting. And then it was just reported a couple days ago, Facebook data from an organization called Cultura Colectiva had an S3 bucket that was marked as public for uh, 540 million users exposed. Now this is stuff that was not sensitive, it was just in their normal Facebook feeds, but all of their comments, all of their likes, all of their profiles, right there, all stored up in a multi-terabyte file for 550 million users. How do you get access to it? You just go to a public S3 bucket, and it could have been yours. Hmm, wow. So most of this, like I said, is due to misconfiguration. That's it. Now let's just say, hypothetically speaking, you're the richest person in the world, okay? And uh, a bunch of people are finding misconfigurations associated with one of the products that you offer. That's kind of bad for your brand. That kind of hurts. That doesn't look so good. So what do you do? Anybody? You spend money. Yes, you spend money to try to fix the problem. So you buy other companies that are doing kinds of this kind of thing to help protect this stuff at scale. Security in the heart, security and security in the cloud. Security is hard, right? I mean, we know that. We all work trying as hard as we can to secure things. And doing it at cloud scale is really hard. But there are some unique aspects of the cloud that we might be able to leverage to actually turn the tide in the favor of cyber defenders. Multi tenancy specifically. So an attack against your bucket might actually be able to tip things off so that we can defend my bucket appropriately. You see? There's lots of information to determine what normal aspects of access are so we can look for deviations from the norm. And the AV guy freaks out. Yeah, sorry. I apologize. All right. So the, the point here is your detection of anomalies in your environment becomes my prevention, or at least it feeds my prevention. This is fantastic. Oh, and we have a bunch of big, very rich companies. I mean, we live in a gilded age of high-tech companies, right? Very rich companies with lots of AI smarts, artificial intelligence, that they can roll into helping us solve the problem. So there are three specific cloud providers I want to focus on for this talk. There are many other cloud providers, I understand. If you work for one of them, I apologize, I don't want to offend you. But here are three of the biggest, and these are the ones that are spending some money on AI to try to defend the cloud. And I'd like to go through each of their offerings and kind of compare and contrast. I'm going to talk about Amazon Macy, Microsoft Azure Threat Detection, Google, Google Cloud's uh, Data Loss Prevention API. So let's look at each one of those three. The first is Amazon Macy. Anybody here using Amazon Macy? Many of you said you're using S3 buckets, so you haven't flipped the switch on that one yet. Well, let's talk about what it is. It goes through your data. You configure it in your Amazon account, and it'll start combing through your data, looking for what it thinks is your most sensitive data. It is applying machine learning and AI to try to find what it thinks you should care most about. And it will label it as such for you. It's looking for PII, it's looking for intellectual property, um, and it then uses Amazon's CloudWatch, thank you for that, Amazon's CloudWatch to look for anomalous access to what your most sensitive data is. Think about this, our AI overlords. They comb through your data because you can't comb through it, there's just way too much of it. And it tries to find what's the most sensitive data there, and it will monitor access of it for you. I find the pricing models of the three different offerings I'm going to describe to you, one for Amazon, one for Microsoft, and one for Google, are fascinating because they illustrate the mindset of, I think, each of these companies. For Amazon Macy, the price is $5 per gigabyte of data protected, plus $4 for 100,000 events analyzed. So notice the pricing model it is based on the data. You'll see that Microsoft and Google's are not based on the data. It's based on the data, how much data you got, how many events you need me to look at. All right, here's some more on Amazon Macy, some of the logs that it generates. You can see access events and what is happening inside the environment. Also, you see automated alerts saying, hey, somebody granted rights to everyone on this. You might not want that, right, that kind of thing. Cool. Let's look at Microsoft. In Microsoft Azure SQL Database Threat Detection, it uses machine learning 
on cloud-based Microsoft SQL Server instances to look for anomalous access. It's looking for things like attacks, you know, like a SQL injection, anomalous queries. It determines what is normal access for your given set of SQL Server databases and looks for deviations from that norm. Pretty cool. The price is $15 per database. In other words, this pricing model looks like it came from a company that is used to writing software for databases and selling software for databases, so it charges you per database. Not a surprise when it comes from Microsoft, right? Fair enough. And then we have Google's Data Loss Prevention API, again using machine learning to look for strange flows of data inside Google's own environment. It looks for context clues to identify 70 types of very specific kind of personally identifiable information. Social security numbers, driver's license numbers, credit card numbers, and more. You integrate it within your own applications that you build on top of Google. So the pricing model here is really complicated. I, I don't have a long time to, uh, to, to do this uh, talk here. It'd probably take me about a half hour to go through their pricing model, which kind of, I guess that's Google, right? It's just, Either they give it away for free or it's so complicated you won't understand it, but you hope it's cheap enough so everything just works out, right? The pricing model is based on inspection units and transformation units. And you make API calls into them, they give you 10 giga units for free, and after that it's 30 cents per giga unit. So how often are you calling the API? This model looks like it was created by a software as a service provider who wants you to use their API, so they're going to charge you based on API calls. So notice the three models. Amazon is charging you based on data. Microsoft is charging you based on database servers, which is kind of an interesting way to do it. And then Google's based it on API calls that you make. Each kind of fits into where you think they're coming from. I mean, with respect to what I think actually applies to what we're trying to protect, I think Amazon's model, don't hate me for saying this, but I think Amazon's model, we're trying to protect data. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, I don't care how many databases my data is in. I don't even want to think about databases when I go to the cloud, right? I'm in the cloud for a reason. But uh, anyway, those are those three different models, all applying machine learning, all applying AI to look for anomalous access. Notice, though, that only Amazon's is focused on helping you identify where your most sensitive data is. It's crawling through all of your data. So let's think about that. So AI tools are analyzing your data to determine what should be important to you, and they're helping monitor it to see what's important to you. They give you visibility into whether the access is anomalous. But what if your business competes with Amazon? And you might say, well, we don't compete with Amazon. Are you sure? <laughs> and also, maybe you should say, oh, we don't compete with Amazon yet, right? Because Amazon is moving into so many businesses. I mean, look, it's, uh, we've got Netflix, right? Netflix has built itself, they're, they're increasingly trying to wean themselves off of the AWS infrastructure, but Amazon, yeah, Netflix built itself on the AWS infrastructure. And we build stuff on AWS in my own company. And Holiday Hack Challenge 2015, that thing is running on AWS, it is fantastic, it's wonderful. But do you compete with them? If you're in the retail space, you compete with Amazon. In fact, you probably also use them as a distribu distribution model too. Um, and if you're in other spaces, I mean, have you seen Amazon's in Whole Foods? Right? So there's grocery, that's a form of retail, but they're also getting increasingly into, they're exploring doing things like pharmaceuticals, so that's interesting. So if you do pharmaceuticals, they might be a distribution channel for you and a competitor at the same time. Amazon is moving so aggressively into so many different businesses, who's to say whether you compete with them now or you're going to compete with them in the future? If you're putting money on it, it'd probably be pretty good. And I'd like to show you this tweet. Is anybody here familiar with the Twitter account Goldman Sachs Elevator? Has anybody seen that? It's interesting, right? It's, it's, it's a parody account of, of, of this person who, he, he doesn't really work at Goldman Sachs, but he imagines if you were in the elevator at Goldman Sachs, this very big, very rich company, what might you overhear in the elevator? And it's hilarious. Occasionally, it's not safe for work, just so you know. But the one I'm going to show you is safe for CypherCon. This tweet, when I saw it, I'm like, yes, exactly. Thinking about Amazon and where it's headed. You ready? If Amazon is in your line of business, sell now. If Amazon is not in your line of business, sell now. Your business sucks. <laughs> there you go. I mean, that says it pretty well. In other words, Amazon's moving into everybody's business if it's any good. If it's not, enjoy your 3% profit margins, okay? Or if they do enter into your business, they're going to squeeze your profit margins down even further. So a way to think about the big four companies that are providing these machine, language ser machine learning services along with AI and so forth mixed in 
I saw this fantastic article. I created this visualization, but this article was written by Scott Galloway, who's a professor at NYU. And it, it helps me to think about the different companies, because there's the big four, and I'll, I'll go through what the four are in just a minute, but the big four companies that provide this kind of stuff. And it helps you sort them out based on the different models that they have and the different things that they're appealing to. So we'll start with this. Google. Google's your brain or your mind. It is what you think about, what you want to learn about, what, what, where your kind of mind is going. That's, that's Google, right? I mean, you put that stuff into their search engine and it learns about you and customizes its results based on what's in your mind. Fair enough. Facebook is your heart. Right? It's how you communicate with your mom, or your dad, or grandma, or grandpa. It's, it's how you communicate maybe with your siblings, and, and certainly your friends want to see what they're up to. It's your heart. Amazon's your belly. It's a thing that you need to feed. It's a thing that says, oh, we need this, I want to buy this. And Amazon doesn't want to put anything between you and your ability to fill your belly or your desires. One-click shopping. That's like crap, right? I mean, it's been, we've had it for so long, but remember when that first came out? You're like, one-click shopping, seriously? And now it's like, if you don't get one-click shopping, you're, you're offended. You go to some retailer that's not Amazon, and you say, I, I gotta click a couple of buttons, or heaven forbid, solve a capture before I buy something. <laughs> Jeff Bezos is not gonna make you solve a capture before you buy something. He, he wants to be as close to your belly and your wallet as possible. So these are three of the big four. Google is your brain, Facebook is your heart, Amazon is your belly, and who's the fourth? You see, I see your smile, you know where this is going. Apple. <laughs> Apple, according to Scott Galloway, is your sensuality. It's the thing that defines sexiness in technology for you. Now, some of you are sitting out there and say, not for me. No, I use Dell, or I use some other. It's like, that's fine. In other words, you're buying stuff that looked like Apple's products did two years ago, right? <laughs> so in other words, Apple's defining what looks sexy from a technology perspective. You might not be paying the Apple tax, but it is defining what that is and pushing that forward. Jonathan Ive and, and all the folks doing that. So it's a way to think about the big four. And if you think about the big four, each of these employs machine learning and artificial intelligence to provide a series of services to you, right? I mean, we obviously have Google Home. Facebook is analyzing everything you do to try to make sure you spend more time on Facebook, right? Amazon, analyzing everything that you purchase and all of your, your activities there. And, and then you have we call her Alice in my office, because if we say the A-L-E-X-A -E word, we were spelling it, and then we said, you know, hey Alexa, if you say that, right, she, she triggers. So in my office, because I have some of these devices, we always say Alice, when we're not trying to summon her, right? Just, hey Alice, Alice. I, I'd like to do a little survey here, before we get to Apple. Apple, of course, has its Siri technology. But just seeing how many of you guys have how many of these devices. Be honest, be honest about this. How many people here have at least one Google Home device? Raise your hand if you have one Google Home. Okay, keep your hand up if this applies to you. How many have at least two? Three? Four? Okay, oh, there's a guy hand still up. Five? So five. So there was a couple that had three or four, and then one with five. Anybody more than that? Okay, good. Let's, let's bump up. Um, let's go to um, oh, Alice. Alexa, how many people have at least one Echo device in their home? Okay, how many have at least two? I notice I got my hand up for this. How many three or more? Four or more? Five or more? See, I only have four. Six? Seven? All right, so we got a couple of sixes and a seven. You, you win, sir, or, or you lose as you see where this is going. All right, and then, now Siri, the thing of this, Siri's built into your phones, right? Look, I do have Alice on my phone, too. I didn't count that. But if you count Siri-enabled devices for which you actually use Siri, okay, I'm not saying, oh, you know, my kids have, you know, an iPad or something like that, that, that they never use Siri. I don't count that. But how many people actively use Siri on at least one device? Two? Three? Four? Five? Yeah, I'm about four or five on that. Depends on how you count. Yeah. Okay, cool. Fair. So we're into this. We are. We're technologists. It's interesting technology. And it's a way to think about the big four. Now, do you trust these companies and their artificial intelligence? <laughs> There's like, no, no, not anymore. Well, just wait, give me some time, okay? So let me just show you some, some photos, you know, just some, some random photos I managed to collect here and there. Uh, this photo, does anybody know who this is? Sundar Pichai, yes. And what does uh, Mr. Pichai do? 
Microsoft. He's the CEO of, yes, <laughs> CEO of Alphabet, right? Which owns this little company called Google. That's right. Does anybody know what this, this still is taken from? It's from a video that leaked out of Google. Yeah, it was last year this video leaked out. It was put on uh, Breitbart.com initially, but then it made its rounds throughout everything. This was um, done within a couple of days of the 2016 election, and it was Google's senior management talking about what it is that happened, how their platform was used, how unhappy they were with how their platform was used in association with the election, and how they said they're going to make sure that that will never happen again. Interesting video. Next. Does anybody know who this person is? Cyborg <laughs> Rock. It is not Commander Data. I'm telling you. All right. This is Mr. Mark Zuckerberg. Does anybody know where this still is taken from? The congressional hearings. Which ones, right? Do you notice like every two or three years, sometimes even more often, he gets called up to testify before Congress and apologize. And his entire career is apologizing for privacy violations from the very start from before Facebook itself was created, right? So this was him a year ago. He was also up there a couple weeks ago, by the way. But a year ago, he was apologizing for the Cambridge Analytica disclosure. That was only a year ago. It seems so long ago. Do you remember what happened with the Cambridge Analytica exposure? I'm gonna get into it in a little bit more detail later. Yeah. Cambridge shut down and the, the researcher who yep. had the technology disowned the entire thing. Yes, they disowned it, all that, but it was done. I mean, they, uh, so, so apparently they tried, according to the head of the, the, the person who's in charge of the project at Cambridge Analytica, they tried to shop their technology for doing very detailed analysis of social networking graphs and likes and dislikes, all that kind of stuff. They tried to shop it around primarily to Democrats uh, in the 2016 election. And the Democrats said, no, we got this. I mean, we've got a bunch of engineers from Google that are helping us. We, we don't need that. You're a small company. We've never heard of you. And they're like, okay. So they went to the Trump campaign and said, do you want us to use this? And they're like, well, how much? Eh, $5 million. Okay, well, let's try it. You never know. It's only $5 million. Bucks. Let's try it. So they tried it, and they found all kinds of very interesting correlations and analysis and so forth. And this all came out in March of 2018, just a little over a year ago, of how they were able to do data analytics based on likes and dislikes to be able to understand correlations that maybe from a human perspective don't make sense, but politicians can use them. They found all kinds of weird stuff. They found out that if you liked Nike shoes, I'm sorry, I don't make, I'm just telling you what they, they reported. If you liked Nike shoes, there was an increased possibility that you would also like the expression, I hate Israel. What? Why? What is that? And the politicians don't care. Who cares? Because all they care about is if I want you to go out and vote, I'm going to put stuff in your timeline that says you should go out and vote. And if I don't want you to vote because you disagree with me, I'm going to put stuff in your timeline that says you shouldn't vote. Another correlation they found, very similar one. If you like Kit Kat bars, you are more likely to like the I hate Israel idea. What? What is it with Kit Kat bars? All they're looking for is correlation. They don't care why. They don't, it doesn't have to do anything with anything other than they're trying to determine, do we want these people to vote or do we not want these people to vote? And then we'll spend money trying to get the people to vote or not to vote. It's crazy. So he's up there trying to explain this to our Congress, congressional representatives. Wow. And then finally, this one. Does anybody know who this man is? I alluded to him earlier. Let's say you're the richest person in the world. Yes. Um, this is uh, Jeff Bezos showing up at a meeting about a year, year and a half ago of tech titans. And it seems that, that Jeff has been uh, buffing up a little bit lately. He's uh, looking pretty fine there. This is before the whole divorce uh, thing and messiness came out. But uh, there he is. So we've got your brain. We've got, I'm, no offense, I'm sorry, but your heart, seriously. And, and here we got your belly. What are we missing? We're missing Tim Cook. We're missing Apple. Where is your sensuality? It's interesting because it's, it's different. And I'm going to talk about why it might be different, just some ideas here. But Apple's stated approach and concerns with respect to privacy are different from the other three of the big four. The other three of the big four, especially Facebook, are apologizing, right? But here's what Tim Cook said back in October. This was about six months ago. Our own information from the everyday to the deeply personal is being weaponized against, notice the word, weaponized against us with military efficiency. We shouldn't sugarcoat the consequences. This is surveillance. Apple, publicly at least, is trying to differentiate itself from what's happening in the other of the big four. 
And in fact, there was an ad that just came out two weeks ago. Did you see this, the privacy ad? It's actually kind of a funny ad. It says, hey, if privacy matters to you, it matters to us too, and you should buy our phone. Now, you could be a complete cynic and look at this. Now, seriously, you could be a cynic and look at this and say, the reason Apple is different from the other ones is because they're trying to sell you phones. And you'd say, and iPads and Macintoshes, but they make their money on the phones. I mean, you look at it, it's the phones, the phones, the phones. All right, so they're trying to sell you nice, fancy phones and other stuff too. And, and you'd say, well, that's why. Whereas the other ones are actually trying to make money off of your data. Their business models are just very different. So you could be a cynic and say, well, of course, Tim Cook, you can say that because you're just trying to sell phones. And in fact, it's going to help you sell phones. But the other ones are actually in the data business. Google, Facebook, right? and Amazon. But you could also kind of counter cynic this. You could also say, well, maybe Apple's not in that business because they really don't want to be in that business. Look, they made a bunch of money on phones, but they've got a bunch of data services and they haven't, at least publicly, had as much problem with sharing that data that they're learning about from Siri and the other services that they provide. Right? So different ways to look at this, different forms of cynicism you could take, but I'm just here to say, at least publicly speaking, Apple's different from the other three. Hmm. So the weaponization of big data, let's think more about that. And I've got some specific examples here. October 2018, so six months ago, Russian firms who build facial recognition software, this was reported publicly in the press, crawled Facebook and took all your faces. Why? We don't know. But this was confirmed publicly. They went for, yeah, for facial recognition. That's what they do. So this Russian firm that does a lot of work with the Russian government uh, now has a whole bunch, hundreds of millions, maybe a billion or more faces that they could use for something. And then, of course, there's that March 2018 announcement. I mentioned this earlier, the Cambridge Analytica stuff. Again, they walked the social graph, downloaded that stuff, and did correlations of all kinds of crazy, weird things. 2017, the Equifax breach. 145 million records, consumer data, that's, this is big, big data. And the kinds of analysis and analytics you can do to weaponize that, to improve your own business, or maybe from a national security perspective, go after another country is profound. And that's why I put this other one in here. It's a little older, 2015. OPM breached 22 million, well, OPM had a breach, where over 22 million government employees and contractors' records were stolen. These are people who have clearance. And they stole not only information about their backgrounds and such, which could be very embarrassing, but also fingerprints. They stole fingerprint data. I've got friends who work for the government, maybe some of you guys do too, who are pissed. I mean, they work as security professionals for the United States government, and then OPM leaked their most sensitive stuff that they gave so they could have their jobs in a very trusted area, and yet they can't trust the organization that was storing the data. This is really bad news. So weaponization of big data. Now, there is another group of organizations that collect this kind of data that we don't seem to be, at least publicly, as worried about. You do read in the press, like every day or two, you read something about Google, or especially Facebook, or Amazon, and some privacy concerns here. But in addition to those organizations, government tax agencies and credit card companies are also gathering and storing this kind of data. But why don't we hear too, about too many abuses of these organizations? or concerns associated with them, and I think it's just because we're used to that. We are in the midst of a technological revolution with the cloud, machine learning, and AI. And that, right now, for many of us, me included, is giving us an ickiness factor. It's like, ooh, ooh. The government's had this data on you before, right? Uh, tax agencies, credit card companies, they know what you purchased for the last 20, 30 years, but now there's this new group of organizations the other big difference, I think, is the new organizations that have access to this data oftentimes preach that they are there to make the world a better place. You see this, Mark Zuckerberg talks about this a lot, how connecting people on Facebook is actually going to result in a better world. A better world. So, so I don't think any tax agency is going to say to you, we're trying to make the world a better place, make sure you give us your taxes. Or your credit card companies, they're not trying to transform humanity into the next level like Facebook is. That's what Zuckerberg has stated, they're trying to bring us to the next level, whatever it is that we're going to be. Hmm, interesting. All right, so there is a class that is taught at Princeton every year, and uh, it's a fascinating class. It's, uh, you can see here, it's WWS 353, Princeton University. It's usually juniors and seniors that are in the class. I've gone there and done a guest lecture for the last three or four years, and, and what this is on, this class is crazy, 
It's science and global security, from nuclear weapons to cyber warfare and artificial intelligence. I do a guest lecture each year on the cyber warfare part. That's where I am, right? But they've recently added, just over the last two years, AI, machine learning, and super intelligence as a weaponry aspect that is in this class. So the weaponization of big data, of machine learning, I mean, it's there in this class. It's a fascinating class. It's really, really quite interesting. All right, so where does this all head? If you think about it, what does this mean to you as an individual? I'd like to make this more personal now. Let's think about this, okay? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand for this next section because it gets a little weird. <laughs> okay, what does your AI know about you? So when I say your AI, I have talked about all those people who had their hands up earlier with Alice, or if you prefer to call her Alexa, or, you know, we call Siri in my office, we call her Sally because we don't want to trigger her constantly, right? We don't have Google Home in our office, so we just call it Google Home, which is fine. All right, so those people who raised their hand before, don't raise your hand now, okay? But you know who you are and you have the technology. Does your AI know when you wake up? Maybe you set an alarm using it? Or, or can it tell when you start doing your searches in the morning? So it kind of knows every day you wake up at 7 a.m. or 8 or whatever it is. Does it know what you like to eat? Because it sees that you're going to these different restaurants and searching for given kinds of restaurants. Maybe it knows the kind of food that you Mine does. Oh my gosh, I like steakhouses. Oh. Yummy. Yeah. And it must know. It must know. Does it know where you go to work? Maybe you need to try and get around traffic or something like that. Does it know where you go after work? Because you're looking it up in their maps, wherever that might be, right? Um, or does it know where you go on vacation because you're doing a lot of research? Yeah. Does it know what you like to watch on TV and maybe your favorite movies? I heard this analogy for YouTube the other day that I thought was profound. So what is YouTube? First of all, you guys know who owns YouTube, right? Yeah, Alphabet. No. <laughs> right. Alphabet slash Google, right? So YouTube, somebody described this to me, this was about two years ago, they said, you know what YouTube is? And he's like, well, it's a place I go and watch videos. Well, that's part of it. But YouTube watches you watching videos and tries to give you more videos that will keep you watching. It is an artificial intelligence whose goal is to keep your eyes on that screen. This is, huge. This is not like TV of the 1950s, 70s, or 90s. This is TV that watches you watching it, and when you turn away, it learns that it made a mistake, and it won't make that mistake again. It is optimized to keep you staring at that damn screen for as long as possible, so you can see as many ads as possible, and they can make money. Have a nice day. All right, so, does it know what you like to watch on TV in your favorite movies? Yeah, it does. Does it know what you search for? Oh, I knew you were gonna go there, but did you have to go? Yes, I went there, all right. Does it know your maladies, like when you're feeling kind of sick, or you know, this elbow's always bothering me, and I kind of look that up. Or your dreams, you had a dream about something, you want to do a Google search, what does that dream mean? Am I really as weird as I think of him? Does it know your fears, what you worry about? Does it, does it know that you thought you had this horrible disease you would die of two years ago? You don't even remember that, but it does, yeah? Does it know the, know the best and the worst of what goes through your mind? Hmm? So I decided to, uh, to do a search on the most popular websites in the U.S. I limited it to the U.S. You can look worldwide, but if you look worldwide, there's a, there's a bunch in there from China and some from India, too, right? These are very, very large countries. I just focused it on the U.S. because it's a U.S.-based talk here. Um, there's a company called SimilarWeb, and you can go there. It's, it, they give you free stuff. They want to sell you a service so that you can do sort of microanalysis of sites that you've never heard of and stuff like that. But uh, this is, as of March 1st, 2019, the 11 most popular websites from the United States' perspective and accessing them. And if you look, the first several of them, let's just say N, where we don't know exactly what N equals, but the first N are all search engine related and machine learning AI systems. So you got Google, everybody would expect that to be number one. YouTube, search engine, right? It's the second most popular search engine in the world. Uh, YouTube is number two, Facebook is number three, Amazon is number four. So notice here, we've got three of the top four right there. In fact, uh, of the big four, one of them is represented twice. We've got Yahoo, oh yay, Yahoo, they're still there. Um, <laughs> number six is Pornhub. I wonder what kind of machine learning and AI they might be applying to keep you focused on their screens for as long as possible. Uh, we got another adult site, another adult site. I didn't even know these existed, um, but there you go, number six, seven, and eight. Uh, then we got number nine is eBay, number 10 is Twitter. I decided instead of just doing the top 10 to go to 11. This one goes to 11, as they say in Spinal Tap. But I, I wanted to get Wikipedia out there to show that Pornhub dominates way over Wikipedia. It's, 
that's that's what we are. That's that's what we are as a, as a society and as a species. And think about this. Each of these organizations is constantly collecting more and more data about you and using it to further its business interests. Okay, so I add this up, and what does it all mean? Think about it. Does your AI know more about you than your friends do? Probably. Does your AI know more about you than your clergy does? Uh -huh. Maybe, you think? You tell your Google search box maybe more than you tell uh, does your AI know more about you than your spouse does? You're like, yes, dude, yes, totally. Uh huh. Okay. Does your AI know more about you than you know about yourself? I would suggest absolutely. It does. It remembers. It knows that you thought you had that sickness a few years ago. Did you see? They announced this new feature they wanted to add to Alice, Alexa. I'll call her Alexa. Uh, this new feature they wanted to add, so that she could actually, as you talk to her, sense to see that your voice isn't quite right, to sense that you might be sick, you're catching a cold, and then, as you use Amazon, they'll put little things for different cold remedies up on the screen for you. Isn't this wonderful? It's horrifying, horrifying. So does your AI know more about you than you know about yourself? I mean, think about the psychological studies. I tell you, I think 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, they're going to be data mining this stuff to try to understand the craziness that we're going through as a society. And all kinds of very interesting things are going to come out of this data, regardless of how it gets exposed. But it's going to be coming out. And finally, do you share more about yourself with your AI than you do with your God? Hmm? Maybe. All right. So ubiquitous AI throughout your life. Do you have AI throughout your house? I mean, we got people here with four, five, six, seven of these devices, and I didn't even do the cumulative. If you add up my Siri-enabled devices with my Alexa-enabled devices, it's all over the place. Uh, AI in your car, you better believe, I mean, Apple wants AI in your car, right? And, and of course, have you seen that uh, Amazon has announced a whole bunch of car services for Alexa? They want to be in your car, why? Because you're in your car, you spend a lot of time there, and that time's not spent looking at an Amazon screen. Darn it, we can fix that problem. Your AI in your pocket, you're walking around. I tell you, I do think Apple has really dropped the ball with Siri. No offense, I mean, look, I said nice things about Apple earlier, but Siri's a big disappointment. I, look, I did a whole bunch of development. Some of you may have seen the talk about, you know, automating my office. I wrote like 30,000 lines of code. A lot of it was Siri-based, and it just kept screwing up too much. So I moved over to Alexa. And it is much tighter and much more optimized. It just gets stuff done in a way that Siri can't. And I say that as a developer in both ecosystems. Um, so you got your AI in your pocket. At some point, AI becomes effectively omnipresent, doesn't it? It's just everywhere around you. I tell you, I get annoyed when I walk into a hotel room. In fact, I almost said it the other night when I first walked into the hotel across the street. I wanted to say, Alexa, turn the lights on. But she wasn't there. So I had, I know I had to I had to touch a switch. These things are disgusting. Who knew who touched a switch before me? And then when I got in bed, the lights were still on, and I had to turn the freaking off. I had to get up, walk. It's terrible. It's terrible. And as this AI learns more and more about you and the world around you, in addition to being omnipresent, it will seem effectively omniscient. Except for Siri, she doesn't seem to be on her way there. But Alice. You walk into a room and say, Alexa, let there be light. And there is, well, not in the hotel across the street, but in my home there is. It's scary, isn't it? <laughs> my buddy Rob Emily tweeted this about six months ago. I'll let you just check it out. <laughs> Think about that infant. For those of you who can't see the back, I'll read it. My son said his first words today, and they were, hey, Google, I'm an awful parent. This is not our future. This is our now. That child... For that child, Google is omnipresent and knows everything from that child from the very start. This is the world we have created. And notice I haven't even mentioned Elon Musk or killer AI, robots shooting things, or the Terminator. I'm talking about AI, machine learning, big data, and the rapid loss of privacy and the weaponization of big data to turn you into a product. There's that wonderful old saying, it's powerful. If you can't tell what the product is, and if you're not paying for the product, the product is you. The product is you. Hmm. All right, so what can you do about this? Just despair, run, uh, move to a cave. No, no, there are some things you can do. Be careful with the data that you share. 
My recommendation to you is, and I've tried to do this during this talk, try to personify the AIs that you interact with. What? Think of Alexa not as a machine, but think of it as a person. Because maybe you'll be less likely to tell her things you shouldn't tell her. Right? Or that Google search box. Think of Sundar Pichai on the other side of that Google search box. Trying to sell you stuff, services, and things like that. Think of Mark Zuckerberg reading everything you type in to Facebook. And I'm trying to personify this with a hope of it will make you a little more circumspect and a little more careful as you interact with these services. Okay? You can also use alternative providers. DuckDuckGo, Bing, or other, right? I tried this. I tried to use DuckDuckGo, which has really good privacy policies, on my phone for, I did it for about six months. I did it on my computer, because on my computer I need professional grade search, um, which means Google. Um, but I, I tried DuckDuckGo, and it just wasn't getting me what I needed on my phone. So I switched to Bing. Yeah, I switched to Bing. There you go. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's been another three, four months on that, and I'm, I'm getting a little antsy. Uh, but there's other videos. You could do Vimeo. I, I showed this presentation to my son. He's 17 years old. And he's like, Dad, no. The fact is Vimeo just doesn't have as much content as YouTube. Um, and email. There's numerous providers for email that you could go to. But most organizations and a lot of individuals just go to Gmail because it's convenient. You should also support vendors who respect your privacy and flee those who don't. Now, what about unplugging from social media? You could try. You could, and I think it's some healthy things for kids, especially teenage kids, to get them off of social media every once in a while. I mean, we grounded my son, maybe I shouldn't say this because they're being recorded. We grounded my son once, this was about two years ago, and we took his uh, social media away from him. He's 17 now, so he was 15 at the time, for one week. I have never seen somebody fall apart that much. I mean, he's a wonderful boy, he's amazing, he's incredible, but it was like, it would have been easier for us to just like punch him in the face really hard. <laughs> much, much less painful, much less painful. So, and then you see, there's many articles of people who try to unplug from Google, just Google it, all of its services and all of its infrastructure. They'll, they'll actually implement like DNS black holing and such, and they try to block the 25 million IP addresses that are associated with uh, Google and all, all of its names that are associated with its various products. And they see the internet kind of dissolve. It's this like this messed up little kind of sub-internet thing. It's hard. It's hard. But build your awareness. Work through public discourse channels. Make your voice known. Because things are changing and they're changing fast. Now, it's one other thing I'd like to leave you with here. Many of you had said that you've done the Holiday Hack Challenge in the past. We work hard, thousands of hours every year, to give away Holiday Hack Challenge. It's our gift to the community. We've been doing it now for 17, 18 years. Um, please do play, it's free, we make no money on it, we do it just for, for fun and with the hope to help people. And the thing I want to bring to your attention is, we keep them all up. I pay thousands and thousands of dollars every year in hosting services to keep this, oh, here we go. Yeah. They heard, our AI overlords heard what we were talking about. Alexa, turn the fire alarm off. Yes. All right. I'll let you guys tell me what to do, but we'll just keep talking until you tell me to flee. All right. We're good? Okay, we're good. Cool. Anyway, for how to hack, please know these stay up all year round. So if you want to play Gnome in your home from 2015, it's about IoT and hacking IoT. You can go there and do that. Anybody here ever hacked an infrastructure that is based on Node.js? Raise your hand if you have. If you have not, do Holiday Hack 2015. It's up. All the super gnomes are based on Node.js. Holiday Hack 2016, Santa gets kidnapped. How many people here have rescued Santa from being kidnapped? You played it, yes. If you haven't, there you go. 2017, you have to stop a civil war between Oz and the North Pole. Why? Because a war profiteer is trying to make money off of the, the munchkins and the elves. 2018, we hosted a conference called KringleCon. Anybody go to KringleCon? With 17,000 people attend this virtual conference. I'm glad you guys went, that's awesome. Um, and it's still all up, so all the answers are posted for all of these things. You could go, you could play. There's no prizes for, for the, the past ones, they're all done, but you can still play and learn. You say, I need a cyber range. I wanna build my skills, I wanna practice. My team builds the best challenges we can and puts them out there every year for you. And people ask me, what is 2019 gonna be about? And this is the one hint I'm dropping. 2019, KC. I, I. Mm. You think? Maybe. What kind of data are you collecting? 
Oh, actually, we're very careful. We don't want to collect more data than we need to. Um, we, you play under a pseudonym, we've got an email address, and that's all we got. Oh, well, <laughs> we also know every place that you've walked in the game. <laughs> so there's that, right? Who does it? Yep, <laughs> that's right, that's right. All right, so q and we're, we're good. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate your time and attention.